Please welcome President and CEO with Quick Logic, Brian Fade. All right, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Faith, CEO of QuickLogic. I'm here today to talk about uh, embedded FPGA IP and how that brings silicon agility to those great 18A designs that we we're all talking about earlier today. Um, and I'm also very grateful for Intel for giving us this opportunity to share about the technology. And later in the presentation, I'll actually be sharing what I believe is an industry first, um, so stay tuned for that. So who is QuickLogic? Uh, QuickLogic is a programmable logic company we started about 30 years ago, focusing on embedded FPGA IP and what I'll call ruggedized FPGAs, FPGAs and IPs that are really built for a very specific purpose. And if we uh, think about some of the market segments I'm gonna talk about in a second, we think about optimizing for swap. Swap is size, weight, area, power, and cost and being very mindful of those dimensions as we support our customers integrating our IP into their ASICs. And more importantly, in these last few years, we've really pioneered a new approach to our IP design. And that's all about doing it with automation in mind, so that as, as we can support our different customers that are doing different developments on 18A, all of which will have different requirements, we can meet them where they are in their needs for size, weight, power, and cost, all from the same proven fundamental architecture that we've now ported to 18A. So let's talk a little bit about where these technologies intersect between what we're doing and what Intel 18A uh, provides. So historically, programmable logic has been very good when people need reprogrammability, when they need extremely fast time to market, iterating their designs and getting something into the hands of their customers very quickly, cost effectively. Um, in more recent times, people are looking at it in terms of obfuscating their own IP. So adding that extra level of protection uh, before they start shipping systems out to the field. So again, historically, these are EFPJ strengths. If we think about the presentations earlier today and what they've been talking about, Intel 18A, of course, it's great for performance, it's great for power. Um, you get extreme levels of integration that haven't been seen before, especially with an onshore technology. And so the markets that care about that intersection of the Venn diagram historically have been ones that I'll call uh, mission critical uh, or strategic type systems. And this is where applications need to have five nines of uptime and with things fail, you know, severe loss of life or impact to society. And so we take very good care and we design our IP to match those requirements of these markets. Now, there's been a lot of talk about AI and comms and data center and those markets today, but I'm gonna drill down really hard here on a subset of those. And that's where Quick Logic really maps very well with the uh, military, aerospace, and government markets uh, with Intel. And so now I'm going to start drilling into those specific markets and use cases for FPGAs and EFPGAs in those. So it's actually a little known fact how pervasive programmable logic technology is within the US MAG. Um, about three in four systems use programmable logic today. So it's almost 75% attach rate. And then almost 30% of the total microelectronic spend by the DOD is actually on programmable logic technology. So it's pervasive across the space. It's a fast growth area. And uh, it's actually started a long time ago that this happened. And uh, it's across all these types of systems that you can imagine and see there. So let's talk a little bit more about why. What are the drivers of this? So as I said earlier, a lot of this is around fast time to market, getting technology in the hands of the end customers. But more importantly, it's about iterating the capabilities of those devices that you're spending quite a bit of investment money making. Um, and that's what we call this better ROI of RDT and E budgets. In, in the government parlance, that's all about research and development and testing and evaluation. Once they spend you know, 10, 50, 100 million dollars doing an ASIC, once that is deployed and it needs to be operational 10, 20 years down the line, it's great if some of that silicon can actually be reprogrammed with updated functions. And that's one of the things that programmable logic affords the, uh, the die. The other thing I'll talk about is that as I talk to folks in the defense industrial base, everybody has you know, their own secret sauce that they want to integrate into these systems. And they refer to those secret sauces as discriminators. Now those change over time, those are not static. And once they invest in an ASIC platform, they would love if they could actually repurpose that across different systems that they 
that they win and have to deploy. And some of that may be taking a base die and redeploying that in new systems. Some of it may be taking a die, and we'll get to this in a second, as a chiplet and integrating that with other chiplets and then deploying that into the system. And again, embedded FPGA allows that hardware flexibility for that main die uh, to suit those different needs. So I talked about swap earlier on, size, weight, power, cost. These are all key criteria as people are selecting IP that go into these system on chips. Um, and that's one of the benefits of embedded FPGA, especially on Intel 18A, because there's such a focus on integration and power and performance that really, as I said earlier, we haven't seen in an onshore foundry of this level. And then another benefit for the US MAG is long life cycles. I was alluding to this earlier when we're talking about designing a system now, an SOC now, that has to be operational and changeable, updatable in the future, 10, 20 years. So it's interesting. Well, I was at a conference over 20 years ago at the Naval Postgraduate School down in Monterey, short drive from here, and the whole topic of that conference was around this, this new FPJ technology and how it was being adopted by the defense industrial base. And people loved the fact that FPJ technology could be bringing techniques or um, algorithms to market sooner because ASICs take a long time, but they were bemoaning the fact that nothing of this nature was manufactured on shore. Moreover, if they bought an, a an FPGA, they still had to do an ASIC for certain functions, so it's sort of duplicative. Now, if you fast forward 20 years and what we're talking about now, now you can do that SOC on 18A, very advanced SOC, but now that FPGA that was a discrete device can now be integrated into that ASIC. And now you get that best of both worlds and sort of resolving the limitations that they were talking about 20 years ago down at the Naval Postgraduate School. And by the way, you can manufacture that onshore, which was largely impossible at that time with FPGAs. Um, so Charles previously was talking about security. Um, he's talking about in terms of puffs. There's also security in terms of IP with FPGA technology. And one of the key use cases here is that if somebody's manufacturing a device and they're getting it out into the field, if there's any level of hack, if you need to change algorithms as far as uh, post-quantum computing goes, embedded FPGA, you can reprogram that. Change the way that you're counteracting these threats just by over-the-air updates into that embedded FPGA core, and now your die can live on longer and longer. So there's lots of areas around that. I'd be happy to talk more at our kiosk, but that's one of the key ones that we're, we're hearing from uh, folks today. So in my two and a half minutes remaining, why did we invest in Intel 18A? Firstly, as you can see, we're deeply ingrained in the US MAG from a defense industrial base. They love programmable logic technology. We saw a great intersection, and they were pulling us into this uh, 18A process technology. And the second is that these are very conservative users. They like to use technology that's further along than paper on the technology readiness level. This is the TRL curve. And so we knew by getting involved basically as of last year in this uh, Intel 18A technology, we would be bringing that out, supporting tape outs, and furthering that along the TRL curve for more people to adopt that into programs of record. So we did this. Again, we got access to the PDK about a year ago. Uh, and that was the first cut. And uh, that started our journey. Remember I talked about automation. Our whole mindset is design something once so that it can be portable to many. And we use that through a, an IP compiler. So think of us as like an EFPJ core, but with a memory compiler uh, for very ease of use for our customers. And so I said we'd be announcing something for the first time. I'll do that here. So I think, I'm pretty sure, that the core that we just delivered on Intel 18A about a week ago is the first embedded FPJ hard IP core in the world to be delivered on a sub three nanometer node. And I'm extremely proud that that node is on Intel 18A and it will be an onshore um, IP for customers that are designing with Intel 18A. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. Um, let me briefly talk about our experience getting to that end line. Um, so as I said, it was about a year journey. Um, there was a lot of support by the Intel uh, PDK, the support team, the enablement team, they're actually very proactive. FPJs and embedded FPJs, not just, they don't only just use the standard cells, they also use embedded memory, so we had to work with the folks on the memory compiler side. But that all came together, and uh, it's interesting because people talk about embedded FPJs being programmable logic. More of the die size is actually allocated to the routing. It's an intense routing architecture, 
And so we were able to really take advantage of the power via um, in doing that so that we could actually result in a 30% smaller core by moving all the power off into that backside, which is great. Uh, lastly, on the Chiplet Alliance, you saw the, the note earlier on the Chiplet Alliance by Kevin. We're proud to be joining that because now that we have the technology available in ATNA, we foresee a lot of opportunities for us to collaborate with other folks like-minded in the Alliance to bring these chiplets to market um, as proofs of concept and then getting into programs of record. Again, US MAG is a huge uh, area for this level of innovation. So with that, um, we're all in on Intel ATNA. We think we're mission ready for the MAG. And uh, really thank you for your time today. If you have further questions, I'll be at our kiosk. Thanks. Thank you.